We're honored to be joined this morning by the legendary John Barber, joining me with Ole and Cody and the whole crew. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Oh, I'm delighted to see you again, Jason. I really enjoy you and your show, and I'm a huge fan of Ole since I met him uh, a few years ago when I debuted my film, The American Media and the Second Assassination of President John Kennedy at the Texas Theater a few years ago. Huge fan of his. I don't know Cody, but I'm delighted to hear from him. Absolutely. Cody, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I can't wait to hear from John and uh, hear all his stuff about Jim Garrison. It's wonderful. Well, yeah. thank you so much. I would never run out of uh, things to say about Jim Garrison, probably. Mm -hmm the bravest human being that would have ever born in the United States of America, single-handedly taking on the entire establishment in the government. Yes. And people can still see John's fantastic documentary, the, uh, oh, for some reason the screen's not loading here. I think Amazon does, there we go. So uh, people can still see the film. You can go to, if you have Amazon Prime, John, I think people can watch it for free, no, or do you rent it for $1.99, or you can buy it for $4.99 on Amazon. It's got four and a half stars, and it's a really well-reviewed film. John, I want to give people a little background on you, because it's been a while since you've appeared on the show. I think you might be uh, the only Emmy Award winner to ever appear on Crowdsource the Truth. You had a background as a comedian, as a news presenter, you're the father of reality television. Give everybody just a quick background on you. Well, that meant that I couldn't hold one job in order. To <laughs> I had had I had to have a dozen a dozen jobs, so I wouldn't know where to uh, begin. You know, we're in sort of uh, isolation now, or what you call lockdown or quarantine or whatever it is. But Jason, I am absolutely flourishing in this. It, it's in my eighth decade, because for eight decades, I felt I've been in quarantine from the time I was born. I mean, I was born in the charity ward of the Salvation Army Hospital, a very, very severely dysfunctional family. And my father so hated dealing with my mother, who was drunk and nymphomaniac, that he opted to join the Canadian Army and go over and fight the Germans instead. And after my father left, uh, uncles came to my house like they were grapes. They were came, they came in bunches. So I was, I was by myself. I was out on the street when I was six years of age, wow. and when I was uh, I dropped out of school when I was uh, sixteen. I came to the United States illegally in seventeen to be a professional gambler, and I had bought a uh, train ticket to. Las Vegas. I had only one suit. As a matter of fact, the book, uh, Your Mother's Not a Virgin, The Bumpy Life and Times of the Canadian Dropout, Who Changed the Face of American Television, that title was inspired by my first conversation with Jim Garrison, which we'll get to later. But in any event, all the magnificent things that have happened to me in my life, from creating real people and getting it on the air, to becoming Frank Sinatra's private writer for four and a half years, and to meet Jim Garrison and to be chosen by him to tell the two definitive documentaries on the murder of John Kennedy and the birth and purpose of fake news. All of these things happened by accident. And the disasters that happened to me were the things that I planned really well. For example, <laughs> when, when I was on my way to Las Vegas on the train, there was an accident, and the train stopped in northern Nevada. And I thought, since I was in the country illegally and I was wanted by the police in Toronto, I thought maybe the authorities had called ahead to Union Pacific and said, hey, Johnny Barber's on that train. You better stop it so we can arrest him. Ooh. So I got off the train, and the nearest place that I could get to was Lake Tahoe. So I took the bus to Lake Tahoe. I got off the bus in front of the Calneva Lodge. 
Now, here is this kid, 17 years of age from Canada, standing in front of this building that looked like it was designed by MGM for a musical with Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney. So I go in and I go to the crap table. I I bought this uh I bought this Stetson, so I was 17 here. I bought this Stetson, so I looked like I was over, that I was not all all hat and no cattle. So, but in any event, <laughs> I, I start at the crap table, and I'm doing okay, and people starting to look at me. Sorry, and John, can, what's the name of the casino, the, the it, resort? It's the Caliva Lodge. Oh my Say God, again. that is a historical place. Oh, it's just unbelievably beautiful. And, and Lake Tahoe reminded me of movies that I saw Banff National Park and Lake Louise in, in Alberta. But in any event, I, people are starting to look at me. And I thought, oh, my God, they know I'm only 17. They're going to arrest me. I was getting really nervous. And then pretty soon, people at the bar were looking in my direction. But I realized they were not looking at me. Jason and Ole and Cody, they were looking behind me. So I turned around and in through the big glass doors walked Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. Wait, now, wait a minute. I keep missing the name of the lodge, the California Cal Lodge. Neva. It, no, it's the Cal Neva Lodge. Cal Neva, thank you. Yes. And anyway, through that front door comes Frank Sinatra with his black overcoat draped over his shoulders like an Italian Superman. And he's arm in arm with Sam Giancana, who was a mafia chieftain in Chicago. Now, the reason I knew it was him, because on the front page of the newspaper that I left in the train was his story about Sam Giancana. And everybody stopped to watch Sinatra walk by. A week earlier, I had seen him in the Manor Theater on Kingston Road in Toronto for five cents. It was a movie called Till the Clouds Rolled By, the Jerome Kern story. You've probably seen this a hundred times if you're a Sinatra fan. At the end of the film, he's in a white tuxedo on a white pedestal singing Old Man River. And it's classic. Now, here he is. A week earlier, I see him in the screen. He's walking right by me. And little would I know that 20 some odd years later, I'd become his private writer for four and a half years, again, by accident. So all of these great things happened to me by accident. I'm the only one in television to receive five Emmys, four for entertainment and one for news. So it's anyway- an I story, John. And I mean, you know, you've told it before, but it always is quite shocking to hear. Uh, the first part of it, you seem to be describing white privilege. You had all these advantages, being an orphan, growing up in the, uh, in the poor hospital, but you overcame all that. I mean, today we're hearing about how just being white allows you to get ahead in the world. I don't know if we want to go down that road, but... No, you can go down any road you want, and I'll go down, I'll go down that road with you. Uh, on my Facebook, uh, I, I wish I, could, I had access to it right now, uh, but there was no such thing as white privilege. You know, when you're poor, you're poor. There is only class privilege. There's no such thing as color privilege. It's class privilege. And the reason that I did well is because I deleted my entire family when I left my home. Uh, uh, and, and so I was out there alone. And as and as a youngster, I'll tell you, I lie. I'm the only person that I know of, Jason, who has a completely open mind. And how does somebody have an open mind? Ask me that question. How does that how? Some, go how ahead. Does someone have how does somebody mind? have an open mind? <laughs> By having no belief to clutter up the mind. I'm hmm. the only person I know who has absolutely no beliefs because if you believe in something, your mind is closed to any opposition to that belief. That's why I'm not an atheist. I do not know there's no God. So I'm an agnostic. And the reason I'm agnostic, if you read the book, you will see some things happen to me that were like divine intervention. So I'll tell you just one quick story about me when I was 12 years of age and I'm alone. And my father's gone. 
my mother has gone to uh, Buffalo for a weekend um, and left me home alone. I had a friend, his name was Don Lee. He lived a block from me on a Scarborough Avenue, Kingston Road, right across from a Baptist church. He lived in the only family that I knew of that was functional and together. Every family I knew was dysfunctional and mine was the worst. I went to their house one day without phoning. And the reason I didn't phone, I was afraid if I called, they would not invite me over. So I just went over and I asked the mother if she would adopt me. And she said, no, you have a mother. And I said, no, I don't. You want to come up to my house and see that it's empty? She's with some uncle of mine in Buffalo, won't be back until Monday. She said, no, John, she'll come back. She loves you. And I said, listen, I, I need a mother and a father. Would you adopt? She said, no, but would you like to come to church with us? Have you ever been in church? And I said, well, I don't know. Do they circumcise you in church? If they do, then I was in church, but I don't remember. So she giggled with that red face and she handed me a book. And I said, what's this? She said, this is the Bible. And she said, would you like to come with me and my husband and, and Donald to church? Now, I think they moved to where they were because they were across the street from the Baptist church. So I went. Every, and I went home and I read the Bible. Not only did I read it, I memorized it. So wow. when I went, I went for 13 weeks to, to the church, and the great thing about the first few weeks there is the minister would say, now it's your private time with God in the house of God. We're going to stop our preaching right now. The choir is not going to sing. You're going to take one minute now so you can talk to God in private. And so, of course, I talked to God and I said, when I get home, well, my father, I want my father to be home. And instead of going to the Lee's house, I would rush home and open the door the first two Sundays and holler from my father. And of course, he's not there. So about the 13th week in the middle of his sermon, when he does this and says that, I just get up and walk out. And I sit on the stairs, the concrete stairs. and He noticed me. Everybody noticed me walking out. So as soon as the service was over, he rushed out. He came up to me, put his hand on my shoulder and said, son, are you all right? It was the first time I started to cry because it's the first time I heard the word son and the first time anybody had ever touched me. Wow. And he asked me if I was all right. And I said, sir, father, I called him father. I don't know why, because he wasn't Catholic, but I called him father. I said, this is not for me. And he said, what's not for you? And I said, oh, let's pray. He said, what do you mean? I said, listen, I'm in the house of God. I don't pray at home because I sleep in a bed where I pee the bed at night and I don't want God to smell me. So I come here and I pray for my father to be home and he's never home. So it's not working. I can't do this anymore. I'm 12. So then he says to me, well, you must, uh, you must, understand God's will. And I don't know where it came from. And I said, I don't think I'm in it. And everybody started to chuckle. And then he got angry. And he said, hold it. Don't let Satan overtake you. And I don't know where this came from. I said, do you believe in Satan? He said, absolutely. And I said, well, if you believe in Satan, isn't that proof that God does not exist? Now everybody's quiet. And he said, how dare you say that? I said, well, if God's all powerful, like you tell me every Sunday, why doesn't he get rid of them? Now, that's the out of the mouths of babes. Yeah. And so I've been a non-believer ever since. And I don't know where that sense of humor came. We had, we had a teacher. His name was Hetherington in the eighth grade. And God, was he mean. Yeah, an Englishman, really mean really fat. He was the only fat person I ever saw in my life. We didn't. If you look at old pictures of New York or Washington or Toronto from the 30s and 40s, thousands of people in the streets, you'll never see one fat person. Well, this Hetherington was so fat, they had to build a special chair for him so he could sit there. And every time he sat down before he started his class, he would gripe about his life and the world. And 
he was complaining this one morning about, he said, my ankles are so swollen. And I blurted out, how can you tell? Well, <laughs> he, he knocked over his chair, ran down the aisle, grabbed me, took me to the principal's office, and they strapped me so hard my, my hands bled. Well, now, John, your yeah. stories entertain. We could go on for hours. You and I have been to dinner, and you are just such a humorous, well-tempered guy. You're one of the nicest people I've ever met. And it makes perfect sense to me that you and Ole would be good friends. He's rolling his eyes while I compliment you and him. But the point I I'm trying to get at is... He has a sweet soul. Yes. But John, Ole. you know, there's been... You, you've had a decades-long career in media, whether it be news, comedy, etc. These things are being censored right now at an unprecedented rate. And what it's done is it's caused us to have to create this sponsor exclusive show. So in just about 10 minutes, we're gonna make the transition over to patreon.com slash light on conspiracies, as well as subscribestar.com slash crowdsource the truth and patreon.com slash crowdsource the truth. But I wanna ask you about something that you've just brought up. Sinatra walking into the casino with Sam Giancano. You've had all of these really sort of chance connections to the JFK assassination. Obviously, Sam Giancano plays a role in certain things surrounding that event. Certainly, Jim yeah. Garrison, your interviews, you've told us in the past how you were removed from the news. You know, John, I haven't had a chance to share this with you yet, but the Emmys, the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, who have awarded you five times throughout your career, have sued me. And we'll go into some detail about that. Hi. Why when we get over to the sponsor exclusive segment. Well, I want to talk to you about it, but the, the, yeah. the important aspect I want to ask you is, during your career in the news and in broadcast television, did you ever work with or encounter or become aware of Roger Sharp? Never heard the name. Oh, I thought he was a well-known newsman. He reported from the Dallas police station that Lee Harvey Oswald had been killed. He went on to win Emmys. He was an anchor at NBC. I guess you might have transitioned to your comedy career uh, by then. No, uh, my, com my comedy career got me into the news, and I still did a lot of comedy while I was in the, in the news. Uh, but uh, this sharp fellow was not an anchor at NBC in Los Angeles, uh, Tom oh, Snyder. He was New York. So he was New York, so I wouldn't have heard from him. And of course, from uh, Dallas, the murder of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, of course, we saw it live on the screen, so nobody had to announce it, but he was pronounced dead by the police chief and not by Roger Sharp or whatever his name is. So that's why it doesn't ring a bell. Well, I just mean he presented it to people on the news. The thing I'm curious about is, you know, you've told us how you were basically run out of the news business when you wanted to have uh, Jim Garrison on your show and interview him, right? They basically drummed you out after that. Yes, but you know, a lot of people call me a hero. I'm no hero. I'm just a storyteller. Sometimes the stories are firm in the in in. In, in the way of one or two line joke, uh, for example, absolute proof that Putin is a liar. He called Trump a genius. OK, so that's a little story <laughs> told in joke form. Or I would tell stories on real people, which made it the number one show in the country. And I wanted to tell Garrison's story. But if somebody had told me for beforehand when I had the best morning show in the country, as a matter of fact, have you ever heard of the name Nicholas Johnson? I have not. Nicholas Johnson was the youngest FCC commissioner in the history of this country. He was only in his 30s. Hmm. And he was a good friend of Tommy Smothers, uh, Tommy and Dickie Smothers. And Tommy and Dickie Smothers called to come on my show. And they came on my show and their best friend was Nicholas Johnson. So they called Nicholas Johnson, who was just publishing a book, and said, hey, you want to go on John's show? So he came on my show. After he came on my show, he wrote a letter to Leonard Goldenson, the president of ABC, and said, you have the best 
most intelligent, best interviewer on television ever since Jack Parr, so he should be national. Then he sent me a copy of the note and added a PS. And he said, I hope I didn't just end your career by telling ABC you were intelligent, which was very funny. But if somebody had warned me that I would lose this show if I booked Jim Garrison, I'm not sure I would have booked Mr. Garrison. But I got so enthused about reading his book accidentally at Edmonds Bookstore on uh, Hollywood Boulevard, uh, right across from Moose and Frank Restaurant, I would have never called him. I got so excited, I didn't ask anybody permission. Just the next morning, six o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock in New Orleans, I call information, get his number, and he answers the phone. And I couldn't believe it. No secretary. And I got excited. I said, Mr. Garrison, I just read your heritage of stone. And he interrupted me with a laugh. And he chuckled. He said, oh, you must be the other one, John. I only sold two copies, which is not <laughs> true. He had that kind of sardonic sense of humor, but he did. it was a bestseller. So here's what I learned, first of all. He had to sue Time Life to get the Zapruder film to show at the trial. And uh, the Supreme Court had to rule on it. And Time Life sent him a copy that was so bad, you couldn't see anything. So mm. he had a, a friend of mine to Paris in order to get an authentic version of it. And then there was a, a forensic a pathologist named Fink who uh, said there was no autopsy because they were interfered with by admirals and generals and blue suits. This is stuff you never saw. And the thing is, the world thought that he would just try and clay Shaw for conspiracy. That was, and, and when he lost that case, the media said he's lost, but that wasn't his principal case. His principal case was a perjury case. And it was a slam dunk. And in eight minutes, the jury returned a verdict of guilty of perjury, and the federal government stepped in and stopped the prosecution. And so that's why I booked him. He said I'd never get away with it. And I said, I've got the number one show in the country for a morning show. I just won my first Emmy. I said, for, and then he said, oh, you expect to win some more. That's how quick he was. And I said, well, I hope so. So he agreed to come on. Now, I'm going to tell you what he said. He said, you know, it's 1970. We are six years after the publication of the Warren Report. The Harris Poll just out says... 83% of all Americans do not believe Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone or even did it. So I said, well, Mr. Garrison, if the numbers are that high, why aren't people storming Washington and taking to the streets? He chuckled again. He said, well, you didn't see the second question, John. And I said, what was the second question? He said, the second question to people was, would you rather, would you like to see a deeper investigation in which the heads of the FBI and the CIA are put under interrogation. And he said, what do you think the result was? I said, I don't know. He said, only 21% favored a deeper investigation into the CIA. So this is what blurted out of me. And he said to me, what does that say to you about us as Americans? And I said, what it says to me, Mr. Garrison, is that I know what my mother did in the rumble seat of the car or on the table or in the bedroom to conceive me. But don't ever tell me my mother's not a virgin. And he laughed. And he said, John, that sounds like a quote from my favorite writer, Mark Twain, who said, it's easier to fool people than to convince people you have been fooled and we've been fooled since November 22nd. 1963, I'd be honored to do your show. The next yeah. day I was fired and he was canceled. But I never thought it was over my booking garrison. I'm in show business. I, you know, I work one week, I work 13 weeks. Uh, that's why I had so many different jobs just to survive. That's why I became adept at doing so many things. And you know, when I got into television, I was not looking for success. I wasn't looking for fame and I wasn't looking for money. I never did anything for money in my entire life. I was looking for me because my hero was Jack Parr, the best late night talk show 
ever who was so interesting because he was interested in people. And I wanted to interview all these people because maybe they had a secret they could impart to me so I could lead a better and more interesting life. And we're going to get into depth on that, John, when we continue the broadcast on our sponsor exclusive segment that's coming up in just five minutes on patreon.com slash light on conspiracies and patreon.com slash crowdsource the truth or subscribestar.com slash crowdsource the truth. I know all the people watching us right now are going to want to join us over there. We're going to carry on the conversation and talk about your career as a pioneer banging on the window of fake news and how that pertains to what's happening in the streets of America and around the world today as we face this coronavirus, new lockdowns are coming, and the pending election, of course. So we'll be back in less than five minutes to continue the conversation. Thanks for watching, everybody. We look forward to seeing you there. Yummy.